Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Shake Up Literacy Learning with Multitasking Mentor, Mentor Tech. I'm Margaret O'Connor, Senior Marketing Manager for Corwin, and we're thrilled to have you join us today. Before our presenters get started, I just wanted to cover a few items. Um, next slide. First, a few Zoom keeping reminders. Open the chat box, submit your questions and interact with other participants. Be sure to have your chat set to um, everyone. And in fact, our presenters have a handout that we will be posting periodically throughout the webinar in the chat. So make sure you have your chat box open. To disable your closed caption, click on CC live transcript at the bottom of your screen and then click on hide subtitle. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and the recording and your certificate of attendance will be sent via email in the next few days. Next slide. Here's just a list of some of our upcoming webinars. February 14th, we have Spirit Work and the Science of Collaboration with Michael Fullen and Mark Edwards. February 22nd, Teaching, preser Preserving and Thriving in 2022 with Douglas Fisher and Nancy Fry. And February 28th, Leveraging Students' Cultural Capital and Assets Online and in Person with Stephanie Smith Budai and Christine Lewis Grant. Next slide. Um, today, we are delighted to have two of our Corwin Literacy authors who both have new books. Pam Kuchakis, author of Mentor Texts That Multitask, which just published Hot Off the Press. Yay. And then Maria Walther, author of Shake Up Shared Reading, which we'll be publishing in just about two weeks. And for a nice surprise to start your week, Corwin will be giving away two books at the end of the web webinar to two random winners. So make sure you stay on to see if you're one of those lucky winners. And now I have the pleasure of introducing today's presenters. Pam Kutrakis is an experienced and enthusiastic educator who currently works as a middle school instructional coach. She also writes, presents, and works directly with pre-K to 12 teachers, coaches, and administrators as a consultant. Pam is the author of three Corwin Literacy books, Word Study That Sticks, The Word Study That Sticks Companion, and as I said, her new, newest book, Mentor Texts That Multitask. And Maria Walther is a teacher, author, literacy consultant, and children's literature enthusiast who taught first grade for 34 years. Maria partners with teachers in their classroom and inspires colleagues through engaging professional learning experiences. What educators appreciate most about Maria is her realistic approach toward classroom instruction. Maria is the author of two Corwin literacy books, The Ramped Up Read Aloud, and the soon to be published, as I said, in about two weeks, Shake Up Shared Reading. And now I turn it over to Pam and Maria. All right, Pam, here we go. We're gonna start with the book, Fly, uh, by Brittany Thurman. Okay. Africa has a birthmark in the shape of her name. In the classroom, down the hall, out the front door, her birthmark leads the way. After school on Monday, she sees a poster that says, double Dutch competition, this Sunday at noon, meet outside the library. What's a competition, Africa asked her brother. It's when you show the world what you're made of. That evening, Africa declares to her family, I'm gonna show the world what I'm made of. Say what, asked her mother. Come again, says her father. Huh, asked her brother. On Sunday, I'm gonna jump, fly, and double dutch to the sky. And then Africa goes to ask all her friends how to double dutch. None of them know how to double dutch but they do teach her a lot of things. The next day, Africa walks up to the poster that says double Dutch competition today at noon. So now she's learned all of this. Africa, her brother reminds her, you can't do something that you've never done before. True, Africa has never double Dutched, but now 
Africa knows how to dance, how to step, how to cartwheel, how to sing, how to move her hands this way and that. Everything you need to know to double dutch. Today, I'm going to jump, fly, and double dutch to the sky. And Pam and I are going to spend our time with you sharing ideas that are going to help your students fly. Reflective inquiries to guide text choices. Pam's going to share multitasking mentor text in action. And I'm going to share a few ideas for shaking up shared reading. And as we get started today, we wanted to think about the steps that we take when we put together the texts that we wanna share with the kids and the students in our communities. So for me, whenever I begin to curate a short stack, I always start with students. And this slide includes some of the questions that I ask myself as I begin to build my short stack. First and foremost, I consider identity. Selecting mentor texts means making sure that cumulatively and across the school year, I make sure that I feature a variety of topics, perspectives, people, characters, settings, and problems. And of course, authenticity of the voices shared is really critical when we're considering identity. Next, I begin to consider those currently in the community. And I see which of those contenders that are currently on my list also provide plentiful opportunities to support the learning goals of those that are currently in the room. And then finally, I cross-reference cross my list with the curriculum. Once the people are considered, I further hone in by thinking about how I can merge together those student goals with our curricular goals. And for me, whenever I'm looking for new texts to begin to update those short stacks of mentor texts, I love to visit the local library or bookstore to ask for sec uh, recommendations. Um, I also see what students are carrying around and what they are really interested in reading. And when in doubt, we could always ask Maria because we know that she's going to be prepared with plenty of texts that will help us guide students in joyful literacy experiences. And whereas choosing great texts really is step one, one thing that Maria and I both really believe in is that playfulness and joy inherent in classroom inquiry are not only important, but they're essential aspects of what we do together in the classroom. And this table just has a few ideas that really tackles some of the common misconceptions around classroom inquiry and reminds us that when we use mentor texts and we engage in a literacy approach, it could be part of a well-rounded approach to literacy instruction and literacy learning. These experiences really do support collaboration, problem solving, persistence, flexibility, and plenty of real world transfer. From my perspective, and part of what I'll share today is everything that can be explored, investigated, and discovered about words, language, ideas, and writing techniques within a mentor text. And the slide is slowly loading for Maria. You can go back one slide, Pam, please. Thank you. So as to really build on Pam's foundation that she set for us about everything that we consider when we look at mentor texts, when we hone in on, the, on those texts that we want to use for shared reading, then we really think about rhythm, rhyme, memorable language, repeated words, rich vocabulary, ideas to ponder, topics, and of course, varied voices. So I'm gonna show you just a few texts as examples of some of these. Next slide. So this is called Slugs in Love, Just in Time. Slugs in Love, next page. This has lots of rhythm and rhyme. Yep, Doug is a slug in need of a hug. But who wants a hug? A slug who wants to hug? A slug called Doug? And then you can see no one, that's who. Oh, there we go. We have to go back one more, sorry. No one, that's who, not him, not me, not you. So then Doug finds the person that's going to hug him, or I should say the creature. She's the one for lonely Doug. Doug the slug who needs a hug. A snail like Gale, it cannot fail. Ah, uh, said Doug, no, whales Gale. It seems our master plan did fail. So yes, you have to check it out. I'm not gonna tell you what happens at the end. You'll have to read the ending to find out. So that book has so much rhyme, so much to explore during shared reading. If you go to the next slide, 
When we're thinking about rhyming texts and shared reading, we're also looking for great poems. This is from a book called Amazing Faces, and it's on the next slide. It's called Me Times Two. If you could go to the next slide, or are we, is it going? There we go. Me Times Two. I read times two, I write times two, I think, I dream, I cry times two, I laugh times two, I'm right times two, I sing, I ask, I try times two, I do twice as much as most people do, because most speak, speak one, but I speak two. I know it is a beautiful illustration, someone said, um, Chris Sonepeach is the illustrator. So those are examples of rhyming texts that you might choose for shared reading. And on the next slide, we'll look at a text that has memorable language. I don't know if you've seen this or not. Everybody in the Red Brick Building by Ann Winter. And Oge Mora is the illustrator who gave us beautiful thank you, Amu, and Saturday. And this language your children will be saying for a long time. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that the, everyone in the Red Brick, Brick Building is sleeping until... Next, we can go to the next one. Aren't her illustrations gorgeous? Until baby Izzy sat up in her crib and howled. Ah! And then everyone in the red brick building wakes up, as you can see in this slide, and we hear all this onomatopoeia and all this noise. And then we go back down and everyone in the red brick building starts to go to sleep. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see. Back in her mother's arms, baby, baby Izzy snuggled close and she listened to the shh, shh, the plonk, plonk, the ting, ting, the chip, chip, and the pa-pum, pa-pum, pa-pum of her mother's heart until everyone was asleep. And if you go to the next slide, I don't know if any of you who are joining us this afternoon, um, Right away when I read this book, I thought of The Napping House. It has so many similarities. So you could uh, pair and compare those two, two texts. Also great for shared reading. So we have um, rhyme. We have that memorable language. If you go to the next slide, Pam. We also have books um, when we're searching for those books that have repeated words and phrases. This is a beautiful song picture book called Palatero Man. And on the next slide, we can see, see the repeated words and phrases. And I'm going to sing it for you, but if you look on YouTube, you can find the a real song, which is much better than mine. But the repeated part is ring, ring, ring. Can you hear his call? Palettas for one, palettas for all. And you can just have, hear kids singing that all day long. And then finally, another book that just has great repetition in it is a book called Maybe by Chris Houghton, which is available in English and Spanish. And in this book, you have these three little monkeys who want to go. Um, down the tree but mom says I'm off remember whatever you do do not go down to the mango tree there are tigers down there that's a pity we can't go down to the mango tree yeah I love mangoes that is a pity great word by the way to talk about hmm maybe maybe we could just look at the mangoes that'd be okay right and so, of course, they go down the mango tree. No tigers here. This is the part that repeats. No tigers there. No tigers anywhere. And look, all the mangoes. But if you look really carefully in the background, you can see a tiger peeking out. And at the end, as you can probably predict, the tigers come out. And just like the other book that I shared earlier, I'm not going to share the ending with you. Tigers! So Marie was just sharing some great ideas that also contribute to what we can do when we choose texts. And part of what I wanted to do today was talk about the power of a tiny yet mighty text set. So for the next few slides, I'm gonna be talking about some inquiry guided and independent experiences that all come from a really fabulous picture book called Shirley Chisholm as a Verb. And we can see that I have some text pairings with it as well. So essentially, this book is a lyrical picture book of Shirley Chisholm, and it really talks about how she used her words to share her beliefs and to spur action. This text set is all about people who brought about change 
with words. And I chose this book as a feature text because really it's an ode to words, which is in my heart and soul as a proud word nerd myself, and is really all about contributing to your community. It has one of my favorite first and last page combinations, but quite honestly, every single page in the middle also demands just as much of our attention and sparks just as much joy. In our text pairings, we see that in the text set, there is a combination. We have fiction, we have nonfiction, and I always like to include poetry as well. Um, we have a place for lyrical texts in each one of the text sets that we're creating. In addition, we have some multimodal options to enhance and round out our text set because we want to be able to invite in learners with different processes, different pre preferences, and also different aspirations. And the ways that we rounded out this text set with our digital options include being able to see about how there's young community members around students' age who are also using their words to bring about change as well. And with this one text, and if we chose text pairings, we can really do so much work across our day. Less truly is more. So we could use this text in reading and writing units that are nonfiction based, narrative nonfiction based, creative nonfiction based. And we can even bring this in since it has a narrative structure in a character study unit and study Shirley as a character in her own life story. In social studies, we could use this book in American history units, women's rights units, civil rights, voting rights, government, politics, and when we talk about community change makers. And because I'm a big believer in the fact that we don't have a ton of time, and of course the SEL work is so important, but instead of always being extra, we can also intentionally embed it into what we're already doing. When I consider some personal and community wellness options using Shirley Chisholm, we can talk about um, with the class being a bystander versus being an upstander, being an ally and being an advocate. When we read this book together and we talk about it, we can really think about what it means to consider the we and not only the me. We can talk about community service and activism, citizenship, the importance of lifting others up, and what it means to work towards our goals, even when we have obstacles that seem to be getting in our way. So really with this one feature text, there's infinite teaching opportunities. And if we chose to use any of these other texts as pairings, we can even enhance those options further. So when I was thinking about an inquiry experience with this book, I had mentioned that I love the first and the last page of this book. So I thought about a couple of ways that we might use them. So with this first page that's absolutely beautiful, or with this last page, we can really see that the words are standing out. All of the verbs are standing out in the text. So we might consider a vocabulary or a grammar themed inquiry where together we just pondered how many different connected verbs can we brainstorm to even what's listed here or throughout the entire book? We can sort and we can choose those verbs. We can generate synonyms and antonyms of those verbs. We can discover nuances between those verbs and begin to order them according to intensity. We can make connections between some of these words and we can practice talking with these words in preparation for it maybe even beginning to write with these words more frequently. And as another option, we might consider again, one of those community wellness themed inquiries, and we might answer the author's call that's listed on this last page. So um, on this last page, the author ends the book with, it's your turn now, what verbs will you choose? So we might talk to the class, what is our goal? And what verbs can we choose to reflect the actions that we're gonna take together and as a community and as a team to work towards those goals? Maria is the um, phenom of the shared reading world, but I also like to think about how I could use a cycle of shared reading to really bring together each corner of the literacy block, providing a great amount of context that's really necessary for students. So this entire cycle of shared reading comes from this two page spread of this one feature text. And as I played around with some different ideas, of course, we could switch these out for other options, but I imagined almost on a session one, we can pull out those two verbs that are begging for our attention, organize and improve, and think about what did Shirley Chisholm do in this book to show that she was an organizer and that she was improving things? What are the actions that she took that go along with those verbs?
We might come back to this text on a second session and really think about how we can provide some contextualized word study experiences for and with students. And we might begin to delve into the spelling patterns and what happens sometimes when we add on those past tense inflected endings to our verbs. Um, we have plenty of options on this page that really are abundant and give us opportunities to talk about things like e-drops and doubling and even completely changing the base word, words like decided, became, earned, paid, directed, helped, wanted, et cetera. We might come back to the same two page spread and reread it a third time with a grammar lens. And we might think about a sentence that we could pull out a la Jeff Anderson and Whitney LaRocca and think about how we could do a condensed mentor sentence study even in a session of shared reading using that sentence to help us think about commas, coordinating conjunctions and joining two sentences to become a compound sentence. We have the opportunity perhaps in a fourth session to bring in a second text and really support students in doing some cross text thinking and analysis. So one suggestion that I might have comes from one of our text pair pairings, Legacy by Nikki Grimes, and it includes a poem called What Girls Can Do that actually references Shirley Chisholm in the poem. So we might think about why is she mentioned in this poem? What other women were mentioned in this poem and why? And begin to synthesize some of those ideas across texts. If you didn't want to use that poem, there's plenty of other suggestions. There are songs from Viz Marquis, Tribe Called Crest, and Andre 3000 that feature Shirley Chisholm. We could think about some primary documents and look at some of Shirley Chisholm's speeches or campaign posters and compare that with some of the information that's within the text. We can even pull small excerpts from documentaries about her and or her own autobiographies and begin to, again, grow some bigger ideas when we look not just in one text, but across more than one text. And again, in a fifth session, we can even come back to these same two pages and look at the beautiful quote that's included, where Shirley said, service to others is the rent you pay for your room on earth. And we can have a discussion about what that means and what are going to be some of our classroom acts of service that we can take as soon as today to try to contribute to the community in a positive way. And once we engage in some literacy experiences and perhaps some guided and modeled experiences that help us to integrate the different aspects of literacy, we might also think about how we can again revisit this text in different ways and at different times to support the most important part of learning, which is that independent practice and that small group practice that students do as they make sense of new ideas and information and content and concepts. So for instance, we might talk to readers about how they can critically contemplate an author's choice of words and investigate the hidden ideas behind them. And again, use this text as a really grounding source to help us do that work. We might talk about how writers find topics that are important to them and then use their words to share their opinion and their ideas with others. We might talk in even social studies about historians interrogating what they read and making sure that they curate other sources so that they can find out if the information here truly is substantiated and backed up by other reliable sources. And if we wanted to, again, take on that action lens, we could think about how allies and advocates can reach out and find out more. And thankfully for us, even in the back matter of this book, there's a plentiful amount of websites and other resources to help young change makers and aspiring change makers really begin to find some of their next steps and how they might be able to do this work. So even from this very few examples with this one text, I hope that you're beginning to see how teachers really can use one text or a short stack of texts to really design contextualized, flexible, and multifaceted learning that helps us pull together the literacy block so that students can begin to make more and more connections. Maria, I think you're gonna take it over from now. Slowly but surely as we're transitioning here. Okay, well, I'm, I'm happy that just the slides are going slow, not me, right? <laughs> um, so when we're think, I think, did we go back one? I think we had a turn and talk here. Not yet, after you. Oh, after me. Yep. Okay, sorry. Uh, so 
as Pam was talking about the cycle of shared reading, those are those short bursts that you can go in and go to specific pages and look at them for many different reasons. So here, are, you know, she listed a whole host of reasons. Here are more, some overlap. Um, we're going to look at just how you can connect your read aloud experience to these short bursts of shared reading. So if you go to the next slide, please. So as Pam started us out um, talking about change makers, we're going to continue that theme with change makers who are innovators and problem solvers. And so you've probably uh, maybe already seen this wonderful book, Jabari Tries, which is the sequel to Jabari Jumps. And if we were using this book for a connected read aloud shared reading experience, we might begin on the next slide with looking at different focuses for those interactions with students. So in our read aloud experience with this book, I might choose to really focus on patience and how Jabari shows patience. And then when we go in, as Pam was showing, into those short bursts of that cycle of shared reading, we can reread to focus on comprehension. We can reread to talk about uh, expressive words. So let's look a little bit about what that might look like. So if you go to the next slide, if you know this book, you know that Jabari is trying to make a flying machine and it's not going very well. And his father suggests that he invite his sister who really wants to be involved to be involved. So he says this, you know, I bet Nika would love to help you out, said his dad. Jabari looked at Nika. I don't need any help, he said. But if you thought of her more like a partner, said his dad, a lot of great inventors had partners. Me, said Nika. We'll try it out, said Jabari. Next slide. Jabari gathered all of his patience. He closed his eyes and took a breath. He blew away all his muddy feelings. He felt his body calm down. He felt his brain start to work better. So during the read aloud experience, this is where I would really hone in and focus on that, as Pam said earlier, you know, making that SEL and literacy connection so important. It really shouldn't, in my opinion, shouldn't be separate. Let's put that together and talk about that. So this book offers an opportunity to do that during the read aloud experience without stopping and asking lots and lots of questions. We can just have that overarching big idea. And then if you look at the next slide, we might choose to talk about, okay, so Jabari was patient and he used a lot of different ways to solve a problem. Because remember, we're really focusing here on those change makers, those problem solvers, the innovators. So we could list the different ways that Jabari used and then bring those into our experiences with children when they um, come up against an obstacle or are having a difficult time solving a problem. If you continue on to the next slide, then we can look at one short burst of shared reading that we might choose in this book. So in this book, um, we can reread to really have kids join in and talk about fluency and specifically those expressive words that appear in books. Think elephant and piggy, of course, right? So you can see on this page that the author, illustrator, and book designer chose to really make those expressive words pop. Jabari built an excellent ramp. He put his flying machine at the very top. Whoosh, around, up it went and crash. His machine did not fly. Maybe it is too heavy. So I would choose to use this page to do some demonstration, to do some modeling, to show kids how I use all of the clues and signals that the author and illustrator are giving me to read with expression. Then I might go to this page and say, okay, kids, it's, our, it's your turn. You're gonna help me out. What do you notice? What do you notice that we looked at on the page before? What do you see here that's the same? What signals is that giving you as a reader? All right, join me. Let's see what's happening here. After a lot of building and stacking and hammering and sticking, Jabari was ready. Here we go. Zip, flip, swoosh, around, up, and smash. And just taking that time to show kids, like you're not, going to read the word smash the way you're reading zip flip whoosh and around you're going to think about how he's feeling when that flying machine smashes down and, and finally in the short burst of shared reading it would be their turn to try it out on their own so you've modeled you've done it together and then if you go to the next slide pam you'll see that 
it not going? Oh, Lucia. there it is. Yep. Okay, that's fine. And then you'll see here, this is a perfect on your own, try it out on your own slide. We've done a lot together. Okay, here we go. Whoosh up, wee, Sandika, flying. So in this short burst of shared reading, we've been very intentional and focused. We've focused on rereading for fluency. We've picked some key pages that kids can try it. Listen, you know, that gradual release, I'll try it. Let's try it together. Now you try it. And just as Pam pointed out, it doesn't take a lot of time if we're very intentional and are very selective about the pages we pick and the text that we pick. So now we're gonna stop talking. Oh, sorry. And then this text set, um, you can, we put in the handout. So all the books that we're sharing are in the handout. And these are just other wonderful books to pair with Jabari that have other innovators and problem solvers. Of course, Ash Ashima Shirashi, if you don't know that book, she's a rock climber. We also put in your handout some links to videos showing her rock climbing, she's an amazing young woman. Nia in the little free library convinces her um, community to create a library. Dirt Cheap is hilarious, also has a great math connection. And The Last Tree is wonderful for environmental units. Um, all featuring problem solvers. And then a plan for Pops is about a little girl who makes a plan for her grandpa who needs a little extra help with mobility. So those are just some texts that you could pair with Jabari Tries. And now we're gonna stop talking, I promise, mm -hmm. and give you a second um, to see if you have any questions, wonderings for us, comments in the chat. And I specifically told Maria I have to close my chat for a little bit as I do slides so I can focus. But um, also, if you have any ideas for other ways that you might use some of the texts that we showed or something that feels important to you, please feel free to add your input and your feedback as well. So people, um, some of the comments are looking at the thought about the integration of the arts, which is a great uh, way to extend all of these text sets. Um, intersection of so many things. Uh, creating a text that uh, helps students look deeper into a concept. So many great thoughts in this chat. The chat itself is a learning experience. Can't wait. You know, I'm going to mind that as soon as, as, soon uh -huh. as we're down here today. <laughs> yeah. um, right. Go ahead. You're up. Okay, so as we begin to think a little bit more, our first um, texts that we talked about, the many ways that we can use them in joyful experiences with the students in class, um, was all about change makers. For our next one, we're thinking about, again, that interdisciplinary study and thinking about how specifically we can bring together different parts of our day. The more connections we explicitly make, the more connections students are going to implicitly make, and the more they're going to see that what they learn in one part of the day really truly is useful for them somewhere else as well. So in this particular tiny yet mighty tech set, um, it's all about the idea of forest ecology, environmentalism, and the wonder and joy of the outdoors. Every single one of the lessons that I'm talking about for the next few minutes came specifically from the Wisdom of Trees book, which is a really beautiful book that I'll talk more about in just a second. But again, there's lots of different text pairings that we might put with it. We might think about those biographies and autobiographies, those fiction titles, those nonfiction titles, the lyrical texts that can help us round out this text set. Um, I've included um, links here that we, again, are going to be sending out to these amazing padlets that are being done by the Climate Scope Group. Um, in addition to that, we see that there are websites, links to community organizations and movements that are all about getting more people involved in the outdoors and enjoying and finding um, real happiness in the outdoors. In addition to opportunities for virtual field trips students might take during the trip, uh, during this unit, or even maps of actual places they could go to investigate more and learn more by touching, feeling, and experiencing. 
So really, I chose this book, The Wisdom of Trees. Lita Judge is both the author and illustrator of this book, and it is an enticing deep dive into the hidden community of trees. It really provides an accessible gateway to a ton of scientific information that's new and cutting edge information, but it's done through these really gorgeous illustrations, free verse poems, along with that scientific information. For me, it really just felt like the whole package. The watercolor and pencil illustrations, we can see them right here on the cover, continue throughout. They're breathtaking and they're so detailed and the illustrations themselves really um, encapsulate so much of the information that we can learn abundant information simply from those. On each little section, not only is there scientific information, but there's a poem um, and the poems are personifying trees and share what trees might say if they did actually use words. The information that's included is really interesting, really important, and also has that combination of wow facts that will keep students engaged. And I really love and chose this book because there's a bigger message. Judge shares with readers that forest ecologists have actually discovered the secret tree language that helps trees work together in their communities. And she also shares research that says that trees actually live longer when they help and they defend one another. So of course, we can easily see this text being used in poetry themed units, in informational reading or writing units, or as part of research based units or content area research units. When we think and we consider language, um, grammar, vocabulary, word study, they, we can think about figurative language that's within the poems, the word choice, content vocabulary that's included throughout. In addition to, I always say every single text provides infinite opportunities to pretty much delve into, study, explore, and learn about any phonemic awareness, phonics, spelling um, concept that you might be really delving into during your class. In science, we could use this text to talk about nature, trees, forests, ecosystems, forest ecology, and environmentalism. As someone mentioned earlier, we can really think about watercolor painting and the techniques within that in art class. And I think as you heard with the author's message, for as far as personal and community wellness goes, although this is a book about trees, we can really learn about being a contributing member of a community. We can think about finding joy, solace, and wonder in nature. And of course, we can begin to think about environmental activism as a way to really get involved in our communities. So in the last text set, I included some pages from the book and talked a little bit about the teacher side. For this text set, I wanted to take an opportunity to talk some about the student side and show you some of the student artifacts from some of these learning experiences. So in one particular classroom, I was able to do an inquiry experience using the wisdom of trees. This took place during the immersion or that initial delve into an exploratory time of the unit where we're building up and you know, getting acquainted with the content. And essentially what happened here is that the class previewed the text together. We actively explored the headings and the illustrations for just a few minutes. The students then collaboratively created questions that felt personally relevant and interesting to them based on what they saw. We posted those class questions on our class wonder wall. That day, we chose one question and we took just a few minutes to find out more. Find out more information related to that question and get some answers to that question. And over the next two weeks, the class continued to explore their wonders in those little moments that often happen throughout the day. So sometimes we would pull a question during morning meeting time. Sometimes these questions would be explored at the beginning of the literacy block or at the end of the science lesson. And of course, because kids always amaze us, lo and behold, what ended up happening was that many of the students in the classroom started doing their own research on their own time and bringing in their brand new knowledge and their research artifacts to share with the rest of the class. And for me, this is what we begin to see really begins to grow from these authentic inquiry experiences that really feel relevant to students. We know that our state standards will be met and we can supersede what's expected and also help student engagement and motivation to be at an all time high. Um, there's plenty that we get to celebrate um, as far as individual and community success goes when we really lean into what students are finding most interesting. 
I also included one example of how we used um, a guided and modeled and supported whole class community experience to really, again, integrate those different parts of the day. So here's just one example of how I could use this text to integrate science, reading, speaking, listening, writing, grammar, and spelling all within about like a 15 minute experience. Essentially here, we used interactive writing. So the class generated ideas to write a poem, kind of like it was in the book, The Wisdom of Trees. So we tried to use that personified idea of the tree as if the tree was writing the poem. The students offered ideas. I wrote most of the words, but the students dipped in for a very intentional point in time. Again, because we were studying those inflected endings and those past tense verbs, the students dipped in to add those past tense verbs to the writing, even correcting themselves as they wrote, right, with the experience. So really providing an authentic and contextualized experience where students can apply their knowledge from word study to a writing setting. So essentially, this was part of a tree journal um, that was being kept. We could see a picture of the tree that the class was following across the year. It was a snowy day. And we see that the poem that the students helped to compose and write together. In just a few minutes, creativity and imaginations were sparked, student ideas were centered, class community was nourished, and nature and the outside world, outside of our window even, was really appreciated, all through this joyful and scaffolded student experience. We can also see that everyone's thoughts and ideas and words were included through some of the translanguaging that we see throughout the poem where people were able to really share their ideas and make sure they were part of the class experience. So here we see that this short stack of mentor text enabled us to streamline our planning, use class time strategically and efficiently, that less is more idea, and help students connect the dots from one part of the day to the next. And here's an example of just one of the many um, learning experiences that was done to support independent practice using this book. So essentially, just to describe it, we see two different examples, which I'll describe of the same exact did you know questions. This ended up being I guess what you might, might call a 21st century jigsaw type of activity. Essentially what happened was the students sorted themselves into small inquiry teams and each group read one section, one two page section from this book. And they became an expert on that section. They then spent one additional class period looking elsewhere and creating additional information and facts to find out more about their area of expertise. Each group then created a short video, short video, where they gave the answer to the question that had to do with the section that they learned about. And of course, they also included a fun fact or two within their videos. So first, what started to happen was we just created um, an interactive class bulletin board by sticking their post-its on a piece of chart paper and hanging it up on the wall in the classroom. If you flip up the post-it, there was a QR code and that you could watch the student videos where they were showing off all their knowledge that they learned through that team research. Um, and students could go visit that chart at any point in time that they wanted. But the students were really proud of their work and didn't want their learning to stop there within the walls of the classroom. They wanted to share it with others as well. So honestly, all we did was take five minutes and put some of their questions on a slide and we shared the slide with the other teachers in the building and with caregivers from the classroom so that if you double click on the image, again, it would take the, um, the viewer to the video of the students sharing and showing off their knowledge. So we see again what happens when students' passions and interests are cultivated and brought in to be part of our experience. So I'm hoping that we're seeing through these very few examples that when we repeatedly have the chance to revisit a text and we turn our mentor texts into multitasking mentor texts, students really become better prepared to practice and to transfer and to apply what they've learned from all the corners of the literacy block. For me, integrating literacy with this core set of texts really provides a win-win outcome for not just the teachers, but really all members of the learning community. And I think Maria is now gonna amplify all of this with some additional amazing ideas. 
Before I do that, Pam, there was a question in the chat. They wanted sure. to know if you had multiple copies of the book for kids to access. Yes, I did, but we were working in groups, so we didn't need a, like a copy for everybody in the classroom, and they didn't need it at the same time. So we had three copies in the classroom, and we were good to go. Good question. Thank you. All right. So as Pam said, we're going to wind up our time with you really talking about that integration and how when we lean in into integration and invite students into the inquiry process that it creates excitement engagement uh, wonder so just like the last experience I shared, I'm going to focus really on connecting that read aloud to the shared using another book very related to Pam's text set. This is called Harlem Grown by Tony Hillary. It's about a beautiful garden in Harlem. And if you go to the next slide, Pam, you'll see that again, when we're thinking about connecting that read aloud and shared reading experience in the uh, read aloud, my focus might be on noticing the character's decisions, because a lot of decisions are made in this book that impact the outcome. And then as we zoom in, in those short bursts of shared reading, we could ponder punctuation, focus on commas in a series, that's the one that I'll show you, or we can notice uh, the writer's craft moves and how they use a repeat, repeated phrase to really highlight the big idea or theme of the story. So when we're thinking about noticing characters' decisions, if you don't know this book, it starts this way. Once in a big city called New York, in a bustling neighborhood called Harlem, there was an empty lot. And what's wonder, if you look at this illustration before we go on, you'll see kind of how it has that gray tone to it. Uh, what's also interesting about this book is it has bookends. So the first page and the last page are very similar. If you go to the next page, Pam. Next slide. In a bustling neighborhood called Harlem, there was a man with an idea and there were kids who wanted to help and they made a farm. And you'll see here that, that it's a similar illustration, but here we are at the end of the book. And throughout this book, a lot of decisions are made to get from that first page to this page. And that would be the focus really of the read aloud experience. What kinds of decisions did the people in the story make to create this Harlem garden. So in, in read aloud experiences, you know, oftentimes a read aloud experience for me ends with just closing the book, applauding the author and illustrator. But sometimes we wanna extend that experience, not always, but this is a way just like with Pam's um, extension where kids were excited about growing things. And this example ha happened to be when we were teaching virtually, and we said, okay, you know, how can we ha have kids grow something like through the screen? And so we found it, if any of you are old like me and watch the show called Zoom, uh, this came from Zoom, the germinator, that's what the little video called. So we helped the kids to make a germinator, simply a plastic bag, some seeds, some um, water and put it on your window and the seeds germinate. So it's a great way to extend that experience. And I saw in the chat, a lot of people were talking about making those STEM connections, making those science connections. So that's a way to kind of bring it all together during the read aloud experience. And as your seeds are germinating, then you could go back in for some short bursts of shared reading. So if you go to the next slide. As I said earlier, we might really want to focus on punctuation in this um, short burst of shared reading. And in this particular book, there are a lot of opportunities to look at where the authors used commas in a series. So Neve called it a haunted garden. It was cluttered with wrecked couches, old TVs, broken bottles, and empty cans. So just as we looked at earlier, thinking about that gradual release, this would be an opportunity for me as the teacher to model and talk about, okay, what am I noticing? I'm noticing that there's a list here. How is that list separated? It's separated by commas. That's what writers do. Let's continue to investigate. So then we would go to another page that uses that similar uh, commas in a series. Her friends came too. 400 seedlings went into the ground, one for each kid, basil, mint, cilantro, rosemary. So now it's inviting the kids into the conversation. What do you notice? What are you thinking? Let's reread um, those different plants that were growing. What did we learn from the other page? How might you use that in your writing? And then 
as we turn it over to the children and it's their time at last food and don't you just love that illustration uh, food created with food and then you can see we have a giant commas in a series list tomatoes cucumbers peppers blueberries strawberries collard greens kale basil arugula and so just as Pam was talking about, the more that we can invite students into the shared reading experience, into the mentor text, the more that we can make them make it like a mystery to solve as we're trying to figure out how readers and writers work, the more engaging these experiences are going to be for children. Now, not always, just like the read aloud experience, not always, but sometimes you might want to have students innovate on the text after a shared reading. And so in this particular book, and Pam mentioned this earlier, you know, the beauty of the um, back matter, there's so much in back matter. And so if you go to the next slide, you'll see in this book, the back matter is just filled with information. And this particular page talks about starting a garden anywhere. And so again, when we were teaching this virtually, we talked to the kids about, okay, so you saw how they made a garden right here in this, you know, plot in the middle of the city. And we also went and went on a virtual field trip to the High Line and saw how that garden was created. And we talked about gardens in many different places. And then we asked kids, where would they start a garden? And it could be a real garden or it could be an imaginary garden. What would they plant there? Draw and label a picture of your garden. So again, thinking of our, our very youngest learners, providing opportunities for them to draw is writing we all know that and label and think about where their garden might be uh, so if you're in the mood for gardens both pam and i live in cold snowy places so we're like have garden on the mind right uh, if you're in the mood for gardens here is a garden text set again we provided this in the handout so you can check out all these books if you're interested in the High Line in New York, The Curious Garden is based on that story, one by Peter Brown. And there's lots and lots of other wonderful garden books out there that you can pair and compare and, and put in a, a center for children to explore and uh, learn more about gardens. So before we finish up, we're just gonna pause for just another moment here and to see if anything stands out. Does this spark any ideas, anything that you're wondering? Oh, My Garden by Kevin Hankis, someone said. Oh, someone else, Erica told us that there's a Ron Finley project. I'm going to look that up. All right, we're going to finish up. I know you might have questions and, and um, wonderings in the chat. And we will, Corwin will be happy to record those and send them to Pam and I, and we can answer them anytime. We're always here to help you out. We're going to end with a book called Room for Everyone by Naz Khan. You can find this uh, online, uh, the author reading it out loud, which is such a treat. Room for Everyone. The Dala Dala rumbled and roared, and Musa and Dada were off to the shore to feast on fish at the Friday Bazaar by the blue crystal waters of Zanzibar. Soon after zooming past Zupala Street, they saw one old man and a bike with no seat. And the driver honked, pulled to the side and asked, dear brother, do you need a ride? It's hotter than peppers there in the sun. Come in, there's room for everyone. But Dada said, Musa, I don't think there is enough room for that man and the cycle of his. Don't worry, Musa, there's space galore. If you move just a bit, we can make room for more. So in came the man with his sweaty old feet and his bike and with no bell and no light and no seat. And after some wiggles and giggles and fun, they made her enough room for everyone. And then what happens in this room all the way along, Musa thinks there's not enough room. But Dada, who's his sister, convinces him that there is. And this is the ending. And though the Dala Dala was packed from top to bottom and front to back, Musa yelled, come in, join the fun. We'll make enough room for everyone. So swimmers with snorkels and tubes and fins wiggled and giggled and wriggled right in. And if you look at the next illustration, you'll see that um, this is also a counting book. So if you're looking for a great counting book, put that down. But Pam and I just want to end by saying, you know, when we shake up shared reading and use multitasking mentor text, we make room for everyone. 
So thank you so much for spending some time with us. We were happy that you joined us and we're gonna let Corwin jump in with some exciting announcements. Yes, thank you, Pam and Maria. And if you do have any burning questions that we didn't get to, because this has been a very jam packed hour with lots of great information, um, you can you can email Tori Bachman at Corwin, Tori.bachman, B-A-C-H-M-A-N at Corwin.com. And we'll record the transcript and send along any questions to Pam and Maria. And I think that is it. And one last big thank you to Pam Katrakis and Maria Walther. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thanks, Corwin, and thanks everybody for coming. Have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are. Thank you so much.